like the way I kind of view uh, companies that are on um, Republic.co or WeFunder or things like that that are really open to the community, it allows um, investors and in, in companies to do almost, you know, free advertising, right? Like if the biggest thing is for you to grow additional users, why not use these crowdfunding platforms to bring more brand awareness? Because companies spend thousands of hundreds, or even millions of dollars on marketing, right? But if you have a well-known, very reputable uh, crowdsourcing or crowdfunding platform to help market for you, I think it takes a lot of stress and burden in building those additional users. Hey everyone, this is Prashant and I'll be your host for the VC10X podcast. And today we have Raymond Brown with us. Angel investing since 2018, Raymond has personally invested in over 60 startups. He was the lead investor for Zestbloom, which is a Web3 NFT marketplace built on the Algorand, which also supports NFT search capabilities. He has helped founders raise over $500,000 from investors, scouted for DVC and global millennial capital. He's also been known to invest in startups before the masses. He's also interviewed over 35 founders who have raised on platforms like Republic.com and WeFunder.com on the Money Clip podcast. Some of his well-known investments are Immersed AI, Alto IRA, Asak, StackSource, and Beacon.ai. In this episode, we talk about Raymond's story and how he started investing, what he looks for in companies while investing, investing on crowdfunding platforms like WeFunder and Republic helping founders raise capital and a lot more. So without wasting any time, let's dive straight in. Oh wait, if you haven't subscribed to VC10X yet, please do and give us a five-star rating if you find value in this episode. Now, let's start. Hey Raymond, so good to have you on the VC10X podcast. How are you doing? Hey, I'm doing good, Prasant. How are you? I'm doing great as well. And uh, I was going to your profile to research for this episode and I found that you've invested in quite a few companies and uh, let, let's t- talk about it. And to start things off, can, can we have your story and how you started investing? Yeah, of course. Well, first things first, uh, thank you for bringing me on to your podcast today. Uh, I really appreciate uh, us connecting. Uh, so originally, how I kind of started was really getting involved with you know, the Jobs Act during 2015, 2016's time period. And I was trying to identify what was the best way uh, to take my dollar forward, right? I was always curious how companies got onto the public stock market um, and what they did prior to that. And what I found out, there were these people called angel investors uh, or venture capitalists that actually put money into these companies to help them get to their growth stage to actually reach the market. And then I've heard stories, you know, like Jason Calacanis and Peter Till um, and so on and so forth about people who wrote $25,000 checks or $10,000 checks and those 100x or 1,000x. And I figured to myself, well, since the Jobs Act of 2016 allows people who are not necessarily institutional investors invest in these startups, why haven't I gotten started yet? So since I would say 2018 up until now, uh, I've been head first reading about companies trying to understand the market and investing in spaces like fintech, you know, business to, uh, business to consumer, business to business, um, and ha- hardware companies and things like that. Yeah, that sounds incredible. And you're in- investing in a variety of industries. So h- how have you picked the industry that you want to invest in? Do you have specific insights into that industry or interest into that industry? Uh, industry? H- how do you pick that? Yes. So primarily, uh, it's traditionally it was always based on fit tech technology, right? Um, but more so, I guess in the last two years, it was primarily based off of not only fintech, but mission-based startups, like startups that really uh, compelled the listener or the viewer or the consumer to really want to be a part of what that company was about, right? Like the true mission of the company. Um, And then also identifying, you know, is there a massive, massive use case here? And can I see people almost having uh, like a contagious like virus effect to where when someone hears about it, they're instantly consumed and want to be involved in it. Almost like how Facebook, when Facebook first got started uh, or Instagram or even, you know, TikTok. Yeah, sure. And uh, when you're investing in a company, 
or, or you're evaluating if I should invest in this company or not? What are the kind of things that you're looking at? Uh, what are the metrics you're looking at? Uh, or what are the documents that you require uh, before you make the investment decision? Right. So that that's a very good question. You know, a, a lot of times, sometimes you might get deals that come across and there's only a very, very short window. Um, but the basic thing is what trying to understand, you know, what's the history of, uh, of the founder, right? Do they have experience in that space um, or do they really truly believe in the mission that they're talking about there? And um, a lot of times, Sometimes those things aren't directly correlated to the success of the company. Um, but after having, you know, a few conversations with the founder, um, recognizing the form C, you know, seeing how large the you know, profit margins are, uh, do I think they have the ability to be very competitive in the space? Uh, is the space overpopulated or not? And are they really being innovative? And sometimes is the idea crazy enough uh, to the point where if it works, it could be a windfall for, for the investors and people who actually use that product or service. So those, those are just a few things uh, that I consider in addition to doing like due diligence, things like that. Yeah, that's great. And like uh, one of the things that are super important or the things that really matter when you're making an investment decision is the kind of founder that there is, right? So what, what exact qualities do you look for in a founder? Uh, because I believe you're investing in super early stages. So at that point, what are you looking for in the founder that is is the man or woman to take this far? I think the biggest thing is, uh, you know, fortitude and, and honesty, right? Because a lot of people that you're investing in, you don't really know them that well, right? And you're really giving them your, your hard-earned money uh, and the belief that they will bring you some type of return. Um, and do they truly believe in what it is that they're doing or they're doing something that might be hot, in the market, for example, are they creating an additional token in the trillion dollar crypto market because everyone else is doing it and they're looking to make a quick, you know, 5x or 6x return, um, but not really have plans to innovate the space uh, as a whole, right? Um, and are they able to handle their finance as well? You know, um, being able to see, you know, a breakdown of how much money they're spending every month or every week, you know, and, and based on that expenditure there, how long do I think, based off of those numbers, do they have as it relates to runway to kind of get their company or business to the next level? So fortitude and honesty, you know, um, is probably the biggest thing I would suggest, especially when they're super, super early stage, pre-revenue, and sometimes even pre-product. Got it. Uh, yeah, that, that makes sense. And t talking about your investment still date, you told me that you made uh, around 80 investments still date, uh, big and small. So talking about those investments, what, what have been some of your most exciting investments uh, or some exciting stories that you would like to share with us? Yeah, great. Yeah, definitely. So uh, I have a few. Um, I can't name them all. But so uh, the first one I'll mention is uh, this company called uh, Alto IRA. Uh, Alto IRA is a uh, program or application that allows investors to take their uh, IRAs and invest in alternative asset classes. So for example, let's say you wanted to get involved with crypto, but you don't want to use your debit card to get involved. You want to use that IRA account that's barely, probably barely making you know 10% to 8% a year and <clears throat> have the ability to invest in crypto. You could also purchase farmland. You could also invest in startups. And what that also allows you to do is play the long game, but this time actually giving that each Gets, giving each individual the ability to bring their dollar forward by investing in all these different asset classes as opposed to just investing in the stock market as a whole. That's one of the companies. Uh, the second company is uh, Beacons AI. So Beacons AI is basically your one-stop shop for creators. And everyone knows the creator economy is exploding now, right? Like everyone has the ability to create their own brands through their own platforms. And with Beacons AI, you're able to uh, bring people who view your platform to one individual place to, you know, buy, sell, consult, uh, give products, um, give them the ability to view other applications that you support all through one platform, right? And they, they're, they're really, really explosive. Yeah. Uh, their growth has been tremendous these last few years. Uh, they recently passed over a million users uh, about maybe 10 months ago. Um, you know, they're a YC-backed yeah. startup. I backed them uh, pre-2020. Um, 
20, 20 million valuation. Uh, so I definitely think they're going to go places for sure. And then we also have uh, Immersed, Immersed VR. Immersed VR is a software application on the Oculus platform uh, backed by um, VCs. I actually backed that company twice back at their, you know, 10 million valuation and also their 60 million valuation. And what their platform is, they revolutionized the uh, virtual reality space. But their focus here is to create virtual office spaces. And within this virtual office space, <clears throat> you're able to see uh, high resolution desktop screens and you're able to code, program, have meetings, um, <clears throat> and they're able to also integrate um, other individuals to come into the platform and use these services as well. Um, so they're, they're really doing an excellent job. You know, they've, they've grown over 10x in the last, you know, 12 months. Uh, so that's really impressive what they're doing as well. Uh, and then also uh, Asak. Asak is a fintech company primarily based in Uganda, but I've also reached out to other countries uh, within Africa. And they have grown, you know, 11 to 15x in a very short period of time, despite, you know, having COVID uh, and, and, and monkeypox being rampant, right? So I'm really excited about them. Very, very smart team. Uh, you know, they do a lot of uh, asset loan backing. So, for example, in that small economy or that economy in uh, Uganda, a lot of people there, they use uh, Boda bikes, you know, they use uh, cell, cell phones um, and fuel, but sometimes they need additional financing to really boost boost that economy there. And their growth has also been tremendous, and they've been being very, very mindful of their cash their cash spending, what I think is very, very beneficial, whether you're in an up market or a down market. So I'm really excited to see you know where stock goes in the short term and the long term uh, future. And then lastly, you know, uh, transit net, you know. Transitnet uh, is really trying to become the first title registry for crypto, right? You know, um, you know, as we're moving forward, you're seeing you're seeing a lot of laws change as it relates to uh, how we see and view crypto, right? Um, a lot of people are scared that you know it might be secure. They're worried about rug pulls. Um, you know, how do we account for individuals sending crypto back and forth? You know, is the crypto really yours? Um, what they're trying to do is, you know, when you get a house, you know, you get a title to your house, right? Um, so they're able to create a title registry for crypto. And I think moving, you know, for accounting purposes and just trustworthiness as a whole in the crypto space, having an application like TransitNet uh, could definitely be advantageous for all the NFTs and crypto investors uh, to come because this is a multi-trillion dollar market. And I'm sure uh, through time, despite we're in a, a cold or bear market now, that it'll continue to rise, uh, continue to rise in value for sure. Yep. Those are some incredible portfolio companies. And one of them I am even aware of, Bacon.ai, because uh, with a company that is dealing with creating links, which is a one-stop link, and you can go and find all your digital assets or anything over there. So uh, I've come across that a lot of times, and I've come across a lot of uh, competitors as well. And honestly speaking, uh, without any bias, like Bacon.ai feels the most sophisticated of all the players out there in this space. Uh, there is a link in bio and, and there's link tree as well. So a lot of players in the space, but Beacon Start AI really feels the most sophisticated. I haven't tried making one yet for myself, but the pages that I've seen, like even you have your own page. Uh, while I was researching, I went there. So I didn't know that you were an investor in that, uh, but yeah, it, it looks pretty cool. Yeah. And all the other things, uh, all the other startups you mentioned as well, like pretty exciting ones. Uh, and, and talking about the crypto space, since you, you are an active investor in that space, and uh, right now there is a lot of skepticism going around, not not just in crypto, but like all across. Uh, but uh, in crypto as well, as well specifically, some big names uh, have like seen a big valuation drops, right? Uh, so uh, does that make you more careful in your approach of evaluating these uh, crypto projects? Or is there any change in your approach? Uh, what do you think? What do you think about that? Yeah, uh, great question. So when we think about the overall market, right? There's always up markets. There's always down markets. You know, I think the biggest thing for uh, anyone who wants to get involved in investing is to you know understand what you're investing in, and uh, it's not going to always go up. It has to go down, just the way that things work, right? You know, even when we think about inflation, you know, we are coming out of a pandemic. You know, we are you know sending money. 
there's a lot of things that uh, can affect the price uh, of a stock or a company, right? But the biggest thing is, the biggest thing is, is, you know, when we refer to uh, companies and businesses, right? You're owning a part of your business, right? As long as you truly believe that there's value there, uh, then I think in the long term, you know, it might take five years, it might take 10 years, but over time, companies tend to do better over time. You know, just look at the S&P 500, you know, uh, look at Tesla, look at Apple, look at Microsoft. And these are really big companies, right? But even for Amazon in the early days, you know, there was a time period when, you know, we had the dot-com bubble and, uh, you know, Jeff Bezos saw that the value of his company was going down, right? But sales were up, you know? So I would say those things are, are important. Uh, and in addition, you know, considering when you do invest, uh, but as long as you have a founder or a team who's truly creating something innovative, you're paying for what the future might have for that particular company. And the most important thing is, especially for that founder, is to understand when the market does change, right? You know, a few months ago, companies were raising at $100 million valuations, uh, especially if they came from YC or some of those, you know, really well-known accelerators. Um, but if you paid attention to what companies are doing now, some of them are having, you know, bridge rounds or even down rounds to try to get through this down market. And it has doesn't necessarily have any direct correlation to how well they're doing, but it's what the appetite is for investors. So the, for a founder to understand the appetite of investing, what I currently understand the market to do and where I imagine the company going in the future has a lot to do with how I decide to write my check or help them and send them to additional syndicates or even VCs. Got it. That makes sense. Uh, l- let's talk about deal flow a little bit. So from what all sources do you get your deal flow from? Yeah. So uh, I have a lot of great, you know, relationships with uh, a couple of syndicates, especially join DVC uh, on AngelList, a really great team there, uh, general partners, LPs, you know, um, I've actually helped them uh, source a few deals myself. Uh, you know, there was also a period of time where, you know, uh, I was uh, selected from Global Millennial Capital to be a part of their venture program. Uh, and one of those, there's a company uh, there also uh, that I helped source. And eventually they did make an investment in that company, uh, which I'm really excited about. Uh, and then, you know, crowdfunding is huge, right? You know, I, I don't think a lot of people know about it just yet. I think people are coming around, but, you know, you have platforms like Republic.co, WeFunder.com. Seed Invest, Start Engine, uh, just to name a few, that allow individuals who are institutional investors to write, you know, sometimes even small checks of a hundred, a hundred dollars, up to ten thousand, even fifty thousand dollars. So, you know, starting there, you know, just scouring the platform, you know, doing my own little data scrapage there, and identifying what's the most attractive at the time. You know, um, and really the biggest thing is wanting to be, you know, I would say compelled to invest in these companies. It really gives me the motivation or dedication to do additional due diligence uh, and, and buying companies that way. Um, and then, you know, if people who are involved with, you know, deals through AngelList, you know, if you get a part of a few syndicates there, you also get additional deal flow and even Twitter. Uh, I'm very active on Twitter. Um, there's always, you know, founders reaching out, talking about, you know, building in public which I think is a very innovative way to people to see the progression. And, you know, you might have that person who's been watching since day one and want to write a check. So, uh, you know, emails, being part of syndicates, have a relationship with venture capitalists, uh, and even, and even uh, looking at my own portfolio companies uh, and having them build one another sometimes also gives me additional opportunities to invest in startups as well. Yeah, that's, that's incredible. Uh, and, and talking about these uh, crowdfunding platforms, uh, so do you think that is there a reason why they have not gone mainstream yet? Because th- there are a lot of deals there and a lo- lot of uh, investors can directly go there and filter out the kind of deals they want and invest in the ones they want, right? But but w- what is stopping them from doing that? Uh, is, is it trustworthiness? Uh, is, are, are they feeling that these people are not legit enough? Uh, or there is a problem in due diligence. So what's what's stopping it from going mainstream? Yeah, so I think it's a couple of things, right? Like the way I kind of view uh, companies that are on um, Republic.co or WeFunder or things like that that are really open to the community, it allows um, investors and in, in companies to do almost, you know, free advertising, right? Like if the biggest thing is for you to grow additional users, 
why not use these crowdfunding platforms to bring more brand awareness? Because companies spend thousands of hundreds, even millions of dollars on marketing, right? But if you have a well-known, very reputable uh, crowdsourcing or crowdfunding platform to help market for you, I think it takes a lot of stress and burden in building those additional users. And sometimes raising a quick hundred thousand dollars just to get you through the next quarter, you know, because that time period is very, is very, it's very uh, serious for a lot of founders. You know, I've talked to founders where they've only had four months of runway left, you know, uh, and it, it almost made them pack up their bags and, you know, try to see if they can, you know, relinquish some of the assets, assets to pay, pay back, uh, investors. Right. But it also allows them in addition to that flexibility, right? A lot of times if you do reach out to uh, VCs, they might have very stringent terms as to what you can, or you cannot do, or might tell, you know, the founders or the CEO how they should run their business. But when you have a community who supports and it not, not supports you in multiple ways from investing uh, and also uh, brand awareness by resharing, because I know myself, uh, after the company finishes their funding round or if they're currently raising, you know, especially through regulation CF, which is regulation crowdfunding, I talk about the company all the time. You know, um, there's another company that I forgot to mention earlier, you know, uh, Huddle. They just raised, you know, $3.4 million. And when I first, and, that, and when I first invested, I think it was maybe like a year ago or so, I was talking about, you know, Huddle.com. Uh, a few times on my Twitter page and even sent it out to, to people to review because I thought it was a great opportunity. And just to give the listeners a little background, uh, basically what it does is it creates a platform for uh, people to reach out to um, resources to help support companies. Like sometimes you are you having a startup, you need a product person or you need a developer and it incentivizes people with some form of equity through that company. So bringing creators and people who actually have those talents and skills you need to get to the next level for your startup at one and one stop shop in another place uh, and supporting the creator economy. I think it's, there's a massive use case there. And uh, I wasn't surprised that they raised $3.4 million. I was really excited and even posted about them on my LinkedIn page. Right. So, you know, um, and sometimes, you know, just overall, I don't think that if a company uses, you know, crowdfunding, they're not as reputable. You know, um, sometimes it might be the best thing for the company, you know, as a founder or a CFO, you know, in the early stages or even towards, you know, potential IPO, you're always thinking of what's the best thing to do for my company at my current stage. And I've even seen companies like, for example, Alto IRA, I invested in them in months later or years later, you know, you had Coinbase Ventures investing, you had New York Life investing and other big, big, big VCs, you know, does that. You know, if I would have saw Alto IRA on Republic and thought because maybe they weren't at at a VC at that particular time uh, that I wouldn't invest. No, I thought that it was a great mission statement. I imagine myself using that particular product or service. And I really had a lot of belief in what the founder and the chief revenue officer were really trying to do here. And, be, and because of that, so did other people. They might have not seen it that immediate time, but... You can't count. You can't count out crowdfunding uh, companies just because they're on crowdfunding. Sometimes, it's actually, the best place, depending on where that company is, if they can get investors in there. Yeah, absolutely. That that that's a good uh, test for yourself. That like, uh, being out there, like, do you get interest like that or not? Right. So yeah, and one of my last main questions is like, how do you create value for these companies once you have invested in them? So how does the value add look like? Sometimes it's not necessarily um, dependent on how much you write, right? Like the check is important, but the biggest thing is how can you help the company go to the next uh, next step in the growth process? And one thing I like to ask founders, you know, what are your three biggest pain points, right? You know, like I'm not an expert in everything, but I know people and I have other portfolio companies that have either passed this current stage that you're at, for example, there was a company that was having issues with logistics uh, with some of their merchandise. And I remember previously there was another founder who had that experience who was able to get through that. So what did I do? I reached out to that founder and asked to them, uh, you know, did you want did you want to connect with another founder who was able to get through that particular problem with logistics? And after a while, they did reach out to each other. I made that connection and they were able to get over that hump. Right. 
And then also, if, for example, if I'm only writing, you know, a 5000 uh to $3,000 check with this particular round, I'm like, hey, um, all money counts. But what I'm going to do is I want to reach out to my network to see if there's a way for me to connect the uh, syndicate with you. And that way, we might be able to help you raise over $100,000. And even though in that process is, for example, you know, I, I was a part of a lead investment, uh, this company called Zestbloom. Um, Zestbloom is an application built on the uh, Algorand blockchain that uh, is basically like basically like an NFT marketplace. And um, I, I saw the company on WeFunder. And um, just because they weren't over a certain dollar amount in investments just didn't really discourage me in wanting to lead that round. I talked to the founders. I saw that, you know, they're really product people. They're really passionate about the, you know, Algorand blockchain. They're even through, you know, an accelerator, even though it, it might not be well known to other people because most people are familiar with like Techstars and Y Combinator. I saw that they were very serious about the product or service that they were creating. Um, after doing that and them, them accepting me to be the lead investor, I went to work, reached out to my entire network on Twitter, uh, some of my contacts uh, in my email accounts. And, you know, from them being, you know, close to around $50,000 invested, by the time the round was over, it was more north of, you know, $400,000 invested. And that, that was enough um, for them to get to the next level. And at that particular time, there were partly, you know, partially pre-product and pre-revenue, right? Um, but I was willing to take take the chance uh, with that particular company. And now they're continuing to build and even have developed a NFT search engine, right? Which is massive, you know, because a lot of times people are trying to see if this has been copied before, are they the original artist? And you could easily type in, for example, Joker. You would see a list of all similar Joker-like NFTs all on one, all on one page which I think is very advantageous for people looking for certain NFTs, right? It's almost like the Google for NFTs, right? So that's very extremely impressive. So, uh, yeah, I think as, yeah. as an investor, you want to do as much as you can or in your space of expertise. And if you don't know something, um, which it happens at times, is to reach out to people who have some type of expertise or can add value for you, for you to help your particular company, portfolio company. Absolutely. I so agree. And like, that, that's a, yeah easy way to like help your portfolio companies. Like you don't have to do much, just connecting one person, you know, to another, another person, you know, but that can really solve a really big problem for that, that founder. Right. So that, that is a big value add right there. All right. So that, that was one of my, that, that was my last main question. And now let's move to the rapid fire around wherein there'll be five quick questions and you have to give five quick answers. All right. Uh, if if you're ready for it, we can give it a go. Sure. All right. Yeah. Uh, so the first one is uh, industries, sectors, regions you invest right. in. So regions, I would say it could be, you know, U.S., it could be, you know, Africa, it could be uh, Europe. It could pretty much be anywhere that I think that there's potential value there. It doesn't need to be an emerging market, right? A lot of times you being the first one there uh, it could be the, the hitter you need in order to get to the next level and really increase that portfolio. Yeah, and uh, what are the sectors in, uh, and industries? Uh, fintech? Yes. Or yeah, something? so primarily uh, fintech technologies or in, in very, very small, um, very t sometimes for consumer, consumer-based technologies. But i uh, definitely say uh, fintech or, or, or crypto um, or sometimes even medical, but primarily fintech for sure. Got it. And what's uh, what's the typical stage you invest in? PC? Yes, so as far as stages, you know, that's a great question. A lot of times it depends on where I think they are uh, in the stage yep. of growth, you know, I do invest in pre-seed companies all the way to series A, but I do have some portfolio, uh, series B companies, for example, like now RX, because I was an investor in their, in their series A as well. Got it. Uh, and what, what's your typical yes. tech size? So it can vary between, uh, 1000 to $15,000. Got it. And uh, where can founders pitch you? Is there a direct yes. way? So, you know, you can DM me, you can reach me, uh, send me a message uh, through my Gmail account. Uh, you can also reach out to me on LinkedIn. I think LinkedIn is the the most popular place where, you know, CEOs often reach out to me and wanting to uh, review their pitch. Uh, and then from there, um, we can have additional conversations and even have, you know, Zoom calls and things like that for sure. Absolutely. Uh, last one, where can they follow yes. you? Yes. So please follow me, uh, you know, on my Beacons account, Beacons AI slash Raymond Brown. 
And you can also find me on Twitter, uh, Chandler's underscore investment. And then you can also reach out to me on my podcast page or on Instagram, Money Clip Podcast. You know, this house spelled all one word, Money Clip Podcast. Uh, and then also you can reach out to me on my LinkedIn. It's just Raymond Brown. You'll see that it says, you know, cybersecurity analyst, enterprise cybersecurity analyst uh, for Booz Allen on there. Yep. I'll make sure to plug all those links uh, in the show notes below so that our audience can get there easily. Thank you so much for talking to me, Raymond, uh, and uh, happy investing. Thank you. I really appreciate you and your time. I look forward to talking to you soon. Have a great day. My pleasure.